Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Kawan Kante again, talking to us about stress MR in coronary artery disease. Uh, the new contender, when should it be the first choice? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity again and introduction. We're going to be talking about cardiac MR and how does it fit into another imaging modality to evaluate the presence of coronary artery disease. As you have heard from the prior speakers, uh, myocardial scheme is a little bit of more complex than just looking at the severity of the diameter stenosis. It has to do with the lesion length. It has to do with the eccentricity, the turbulence of flow, the morphology of that lesion. But also, let's not forget about the myocardial blood flow, the presence of collaterals, as well as a microvascular resistance. So ultimately, the interplay between the lesion itself as well as the myocardial microcirculation will be ultimately leading not only to the symptoms, but the presence of myocardial scheme as we would detect. The EUR-CMR survey, which came almost about 10 years ago, was a very good a way to describe back in centers in Europe, uh, what is the most common applications that cardiac MRI has taken place. So for example, we'll look at myocarditis and cardiomyopathy this afternoon. This is an important area that cardiac MR is, but suspected coronary artery disease and ischemia, as well as the presence of myocardial variability, is more than two thirds of that. The importance of evaluation of these patients on the magnet is that, you know, similar to what Dr. Zogby has shown with the use of uh, myocardial contrast agents, is the change in therapies, not only medications, but procedures, and overall patient management treatment decisions that will be determined once we have the diagnosis. Once we can see it better, we can act more informally, and that hopefully translate into outcomes. So let's take a look in the case here. And I would start with this case of how old again. So he's 19 years old with a BMI of 35, but otherwise healthy, presented to the emergency room of chest pain. His symptoms were non-exertional in nature, and he had been present for the past three weeks. At the emergency room, he was afar by hypertensive, as you can see, otherwise normal vital signs. EKG demonstrated normal sinus rhythm with non-specific T-wave inversions, had three negative troponins. One could argue that this patient could have gone to the coronary CT, but we decided to start with the echocardiography, admit to the short stay, have the echo done, which showed very difficult images despite IV contrast, and the stress CMR was then requested for this patient. Start with the cine images. We're looking at you know, myocardial function. You know, because of the potential for myocarditis, although the uh, troponins were negative, we can see that the overall myocardial contractility is normal, except for very subtle hypokinesis at this you know, mid-anterior wall here that we can barely see, and maybe distal apical. But overall, biventricular function is preserved, no significant valvular disease. The stress modality that we use is a ragadenazon, uh, which is similarly used in the nuclear lab. It's one injection fits all. We don't need to pump. Uh, we don't need a pump. We don't need to calculate the dose. And as you can see in this first pulse perfusion, gadolinium arrives into the right ventricle, circulates into the left side, and you can see there is this persistency of this large perfusion defect, spanning all along from the base all the way through the apex, involving the LAD distribution. This patient actually became symptomatic with the use of ragadenazone, which is not a good sign. Uh, we had to pull him out and uh, give him nitroglycerin. Uh, and because we had already injected the, uh, both the stress agent as well as the gadolinium, we said, let's bring him back down now that the, the signs are better, the, the vitals are better, and get some images so at least we can see you know, whether there is any myocardial infarction or not. And you can see that there is a very subtle subendocardial myocardial infarction that he might have sustained at some point in time. The image quality was not so good. He was still breathing in and out and tachycardic, as typically occurs after ragadenosine. So from one table to another, to the CAF table now, and as you can see that it has this very odd looking, eccentric proximal LED lesion that you know, was uh, very um, easy to cross, but he had Timmy Chuflo. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know why it's not playing again, but let's see. And uh, this was stented, and as you can see, a very good results. He um, has been doing well four months after his PCI. Um, he um, now was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and starting therapy, and has been exercising now a significant life-changing event. So quite young individuals, so chronological age versus biological age, and that's an important concept. 
So what do the guidelines say about stress CMR? The 2013 appropriateness criteria had mentioned that cardiac MRI should be another contestant here, as similar to stress nuclear and stress echo, in patients that have either intermediate or high pretest probability of CAD and have uninterpretable EKG, be that lymph bundle branch block, pace rhythm, et cetera, or in patients that have high pretest probability of CAD. So it competes with these other modalities. But the assessment of the pretest probability of CD that we still are using is predominantly Diamond Forrester criteria, which has, uh, as you heard from the prior speaker, might be overestimating the risk disease. And by doing that, we might be testing a lot of patients that might not need testing, quite honestly. And that's why it's probably so hard to demonstrate the incremental value and the outcomes value of imaging directly. Uh, by testing patients that might not necessarily need that. The evidence for those uh, appropriateness criteria guidelines comes from this very uh, large uh, study uh, by, led by Dr. John Greenwood from uh, Leeds in UK. Um, the study was very hard to be done, but they ended up uh, bringing to the finish line. All patients had both CMR and SPECT and coronary angiography. And they were randomized to either have the CMR first or SPECT or SPECT first and then CMR. And regardless of whether there were males or females, single vessel disease or multi-vessel disease, the area under the curve of CMR was superior to SPECT. It argued that we're not comparing apples to apples because obviously spatial resolution of uh, SPECT uh, seems to be inferior, is a pre you know, predominantly inferior to um, conventional CMR imaging. It would be probably better comparison of CMR versus SPECT but I'll leave that to the expert. But in this case here, they highlight in a patient that had occlusion of this mid-circumflex infralateral perfusion defect, which was missed in this patient uh, after attenuation correction for these large breasts. So, you know, we might be underestimating ischemia in uh, such patients. So not only CMR can provide the diagnosis, but also the prognosis. Uh, these curves are hard to see, but I would point it out to this table here, looking at an abnormal result by CMR was associated after multivariate analysis with a hazard ratio of 2.3, whereas the SPECT abnormal result was uh, 1.4, but crossed the unity, so not a statistically significant. The other piece of information that has come more recently, presented at ACC 2017, and we're waiting for the publication of this study, was led by Dr. Eike Nagel from um, Germany. 918 patients with chronic stable angina, class two or three, all receiving optical medical therapy. They were randomized into uh, coronary angiography with FFR versus a stress CMR. It's a pragmatic trial trying to see if we find ischemia by the CMR, we should revascularize. Other than that, this patient should continue to be treated medically. And within a short follow-up time of only 12 months, there was a very low event rate, as you can see, but in, there was no significant differences in the outcomes compared CMR versus FFR. But CMR was able to provide uh, less patients referred to the cath lab and lower number of revascularization, potentially being a cost-saving strategies. We're definitely long, waiting for a longer follow-up time to better inform um, how the CMR might fit into um, as another contestant. One important uh, pitfall that we need to be aware of by doing this technique is obviously the dark rim artifact. This is um, a technical problem, but it could be actually a physiological problem. From the technical problem, it has to do with the spatial resolution of several factors. So one is the spatial resolution. Uh, that we use currently in the pulse sequences to evaluate perfusion. The second has to do with the cardiac motion because we are not asking these patients to breath hold. So there is software that corrects for the breath motion. Uh, but also that has to do with the spatial resolution uh, used for that. So dark rim artifact has some technical issues. Pulse sequences are improving for that. And what we typically need to see to call a positive stress test is to let this uh, blood pool cavity signal to decrease and look at this persistency of this darker signal that would be indicative of a true myocardial perfusion defect. Having rest perfusion is something that certain labs do. We particularly do not do rest perfusion, so we cut down the administration of the gadolinium in half, and we use rather the late gadolinium enhancement as the surrogate for myocardial scar and to inform that. 
uh, work by my colleague in Brazil, uh, Juliano Fernandes, uh, working with also Peter Kelman, has been able to do an entire free breathing MRI scan using uh, algorithms that can co-register diaphragmatic motion and do true perfusion maps. Uh, this is going to be coming very soon, probably in the next year or so, in availability of to quantitate coronary flow, re flow reserve as well as myocardial blood flow similar to PET, and this I think is going to be a very important breakthrough. Stress CMR with exercise has also been attempted and shown to be feasible, uh, but it requires definitely a special setup. This was a trial that we participated along with the group at Ohio State University. Uh, what it happens here is this is a hydraulic uh, treadmill that does not have obviously any ferromagnetic parts. It's all powered by hydraulics. And the similar EKG signal that you would get, the patient actually should lie down into this um, uh, mattress that is uh, similarly molded for what is used on oncology. So it has kind of a registration of the body. The patient does that, the mattress is empty, so when the patient finishes the stress, he can lie down quickly into the magnet and get into uh, the lie down on the table and then get into the magnet. And what the study authors have been able to show in this recent publication is that compared to SPECT, uh, CMR with exercise provides not only the prognostic information of exercise, but also very good accuracy in the detection of coronary artery disease. In this past SCMR, just a couple weeks ago, uh, there were lots of uh, areas of interest of debate as well. Um, debates about how should we acquire these images. There is still yet, uh, believe it or not, not consensus on which stress agent should we be using, how much, what contrast agent, how do we verify the adequacy of the vasodilator stress. So if we use adenosine or dipyridamol, we can look at the spleen. If the spleen does not lit up after we inject the bregadinazon, that means that there was, not there was not adequate vasodilation and this patient probably has taken some caffeine or, or did not reach the adequate vasodilation. But if we use bregadinazon, we don't have a way to verify. We usually rely on a heart rate increase. Uh, readout sequences, there are several ones, and there's going to be continued improvement. Do we need whole heart coverage, or do we just need those three slices, basal, mid, and apical? Our lab, we have parallel processing. We usually acquire six images, but some might argue that three might be enough. We don't, need, we don't have a consensus. Do we need rest images? Do we need to inject another uh, gadolinium, or can we just use the SCAR images, which is what we have been using? Post-processing, there's no consensus between the visual analysis, which seems to be quite adequate, but we should probably consider moving forward with those parametric maps to quantitate how much perfusion do we have and how much does that augment, similar to what has been done on PET and now moving into SPECT. And this topic of perfusion, I could go on and on. This was a whole day dedicated workshop just for that. And then the beauty of that, uh, as I mentioned before, was that you, know, you have scientists next to uh, biophysicists, clinicians trying to you know, really crack the code and trying to understand how we can deliver this to patient care. One of the particular uh, presentations that I was quite interested in was the native T1. That is doing a stress test without no gadolinium. You just measure the T1 time native, you gave the vasodilator stress, and you see the delta change. And that might be, and that was shown to have a very good correlation with the gadolinium based uh, technique. But this might be coming down in some clinical trials in the future. So, answering the question to conclude, when should we consider the first choice? Particularly, I would say in large obese patients, whether you have or not established coronary disease. That has to do with some potential for attenuation artifacts that we might be missing, as well as then the very uh, good coverage and spatial resolution of CMR. Patients with left bundle and paced rhythm, as mentioned by the appropriateness criteria, equivocal stress tests, particularly women, phenomenon of chest pain with normal stress tests where microvascular disease is suspected. And this is work uh, that Dr. Colin Berry is doing in Glasgow, trying to now use in parametric maps, trying to understand whether that dark cream artifact might be a surrogate for potentially microvascular disease that we might be able to capture that. So more to come from that end. So I hope to have shown that stress CMR is safe. It has a good diagnostic accuracy comparable to the other stress modalities. The comparative effectiveness looking at CMR versus other modalities is going to be necessary. And definitely technological advances will continue to expand their utilization. Well, thank you very much.